Welcome to worship here at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. My name is Pastor Eric, and we're so glad you're here to join us online. Also, happy 4th of July on this weekend. We're so thankful this year we can gather together in ways that we could not last year because of COVID. We're also thankful that we can celebrate the freedoms that we have in our nation. Before we continue with worship, I just want to lift up to you an announcement. Last Sunday, we held our final fundraiser for our sister church in El Salvador. We sold pupusas on the patio, which is an El Salvadorian dish. A special thanks to everyone who worked hard to put on the fundraiser and everyone who supported it. We raised over $4,000, and combined with the rest of the money that we had raised uh, prior in the month, our total comes to $7,000 thousand dollars way more than we expected that we were going to raise this will cover the teacher for the rest of the school year and perhaps some christmas gifts for the kids and even the teacher perhaps to the next year thank you again for your support we continue our service with an order of confession and forgiveness blessed be the holy trinity one god the god of manna the god of miracles the god of mercy amen Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us now confess our sin. God, our provider, we ask you to help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share at times. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you, for where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life, and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus the manna from heaven you are fed and nourished. By Jesus the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. We continue with our opening song.
joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible. Joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible. Joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible. Just to know. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God of the covenant, in our baptism you call us to proclaim the coming of your kingdom. Give us the courage that you gave the apostles. We may faithfully witness to your love and peace in every circumstance of life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We continue by singing our Kyrie. The first reading is from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 2. He said to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet, and I will speak with you. And when he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. He said to me, Mortal, I am sending you to the people of Israel to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me, they and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants are impudent and stubborn. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that there has been a prophet among them. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia.
The Gospel according to Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. A pastor tells of a time when he was a young man and was traveling with a singing group one summer. They would go from town to town, visiting different churches, putting on musical programs with a gospel message. While they were mostly received in a positive manner, not everyone appreciated their style of presentation. In fact, at the first church where they visited, they learned there was a man who had said before they came that if any of those kids has a guitar or a beard, then I'm leaving. The pastor said at the time he did have a beard and he played guitar in the traveling band. Sure enough, true to his word, the man had left. This saddened the group when they learned about it. Because the man could not accept the messengers, he missed out on the message. The man seems to have fallen prey to either or thinking. He had a preconceived notion of what he thought a Christian should look like, and the person had to either look like that or he was not going to listen to them. Jesus, you might say, falls prey to this kind of either-or thinking in today's gospel reading from Mark. He's been away from Nazareth for a while. He left the town where he grew up to go and join John the Baptist in the wilderness. He had been traveling from town to town across the Galilean countryside, healing people, performing miracles, and teaching about the kingdom of God. Now he's returned to his hometown, and I can imagine he was eager to see his family and his friends. But Jesus does not quite get the reception that he might have expected. Instead, the local folks don't seem to want to listen to him, and they doubt he really has the authority or credentials to be teaching the way that he is. The Bible tells us Jesus could do no deed of power in his hometown, and he was amazed at their unbelief. Why didn't the folks in Jesus' own hometown seem to respect him? Why is it that they did not seem to want to listen to him? One reason could be that his own people thought they knew him too well to believe what he was saying. As we hear them declare, is not this the carpenter? And are not these his relatives who are with us? It was apparently inconceivable to them that God could be at home and at work in someone that they saw as just a simple commoner like themselves. 
The commentator Ben Witherington expounds more on this thought as he writes, Notice the local folks are just dumbfounded that this teaching could come from a hometown boy like Jesus. More than just a matter of familiarity breeding contempt, their shock comes from an ancient mentality that geographical and hereditary origins determined who a person was and what his or her capacities will always be. They see Jesus as someone who's not merely exceeding expectations, but is overreaching. In other words, Jesus had a certain station in life. He was a carpenter. The local folks couldn't just get past the fact that this same Jesus was the kid that they had known growing up in their own neighborhood. To them, either a teacher had the proper training or a prophet came from somewhere else, or they couldn't possibly be a real teacher or a real prophet because his hometown could not allow for the possibility that Jesus could be both from their simple village and a prophet of God or that he could be both a humble carpenter and a dynamic teacher, they missed out on the life-giving miracles and preaching that Jesus had done in their other towns. Are there times when we miss out on a life-giving message because we have already prejudged the messenger? Do we ever fall prey to either-or thinking, which causes us to miss out on the humanity or the gifts of another person? Do we ever discount people or make assumptions about them based on what they wear or how they look? Do we categorize people based on where they are from, what skin color they happen to have, or whether or not they have a certain job? a criminal record, or different physical or mental capabilities? Is there more that we could see and learn from other people if we were allowing for a more both-and kind of thinking as opposed to either-or kind of thinking? One thing I really appreciate about the Lutheran take on Christian Christianity is the emphasis on allowing for the both and within people, as well as the both and and how we talk about God or belief. One of the theological concepts that Martin Luther developed was the idea that we are both saint and sinners. In other words, there is good and bad mixed up in everyone. Through baptism, we are made saints, holy and blameless before God, but at the same time, we are not perfect. We continue to make mistakes and have our shortcomings. I really appreciate this honest approach to the human experience. It shows that we all have sins from our past, but that doesn't mean we cannot still bring a message of love or a witness of peace into our present situation. It means that we can be people who both strive for the ideal values of faith and yet still fall short of who God calls us to be. Just as people can be both saints and sinners, this is also true for groups of people, like tribes or even countries. In the first reading, we heard God sending the prophet Ezekiel to speak to the people, and God tells the prophet, I am sending you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this very day. But just because Israel is rebellious at times does not mean that God has not worked through them or will not continue to work through them. As God says to Abram when God is looking to establish the nation of Israel, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. Israel can be both a blessing and rebellious. They fall short, yet God calls them to continue to be a witness to the other nations. On this 4th of July, I was thinking about this concept in regards to our own nation. 
Sometimes as various issues are debated on the national stage, we can fall into an either or kind of thinking that causes conflict or a heightened sense of division, which is really not helpful for finding solutions to our problems. We get into making prejudgments about people that categorizes them as this way or that way in a manner that then does not allow us to hear each other and work towards a greater unity of purpose. As part of my research for the sermon this week, I was looking at various patriotic hymns or songs that have come to have significance for our country. One of the songs I was reading was America the Beautiful. The lyrics to the song were originally a poem written by a woman named Catherine Lee Bates. She was an English professor at Wesley College. In 1893, she was a visiting professor at Colorado College to teach summer school. On her journey across the country, Bates witnessed firsthand the vast amber waves of grain in America's Great Plains. She also admired images of futuristic gleaming white alabaster cities at Chicago's World's Fair. At one point that summer, she took a trip up to the 14,000-foot mountain called Pikes Peak, where she was deeply stirred by a vision of America's beauties. The thrilling experience of being surrounded by purple mountain majesties with fruited plains stretching far into the east below inspired Bates to write America the Beautiful, a poem originally entitled Pike's Peak. Catherine Lee's Bates' words stir us with a vision of a land graced by abundant natural beauty. But more than the physical beauty celebrated in the poem, Bates also speaks to the beauty of American ideals, such as freedom and community and self-sacrifice. She evokes the dreams of pilgrims and patriots and all those who more than self their country loved and mercy more than life. John Tanner, who is a university president and a person of faith, wrote this about the song. Bates recognizes that America, however, blessed with natural beauties, lofty ideals and patriot dreams, is also a work in progress a flawed and an imperfect republic. Bates repeatedly acknowledges that America needs God's grace to mend its flaws and refine its gold, that its successes need to be rooted in nobleness, that its gains must not be merely material but divine, and that our much-vaunted liberty must be grounded in self-control and in the law. If America needed these reminders in the late 19th century, then we still need to be reminded of them today. I suppose every generation needs to be reminded to embrace what Abraham Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. This is an ongoing struggle, but it is one that can be approached from the both and point of view, where the ideals and values of a nation can be lifted up while at the same time being honest about how we have come up short on those ideals and that work still needs to be done. During the first 300 years or so of Christianity, there was a lot of debate about the history of Jesus Christ and who he was. The debate was about Jesus as the ideal son of God versus Jesus who enters the fragility and flaws of human life. Now, there were some Christian communities who believed Jesus was only human, but not divine. And still others who believed Jesus was never quite fully human, but only divine. There were still others who said he wasn't always God, but later became like God partway through his life. Now, these debates got quite heated at times, and in some ways they still continue between Christian communities today. But at one point, a council was called in the city of Nicaea, where many bishops and early church leaders were brought together in order to bring more unity among the churches. It was here the Nicene Creed was developed, which brought many churches together by moving things from an either-or debate to a both-and proposition, 
a proposition that put together the two main notions from their debates by saying that Jesus was both human and divine, that he both suffered and died and also was raised and came alive again. And this became a crucial belief for Christians as it allows us to connect with the Jesus who knows our joys and our sorrows and what it feels like to be human, but also the Jesus who brings us comfort, knowing there is a power bigger than our own who has conquered the forces of sin and death. Let us remember then that we are both saints and sinners, and let us then give each other an extra measure of forgiveness and understanding. Let us remember that because Jesus was both human and divine, he not only rises above the world in order to save it, but he also enters into the world in order to embrace it in all its fragility and its messiness. This means that we not only have the hope of a future heaven, but we also have the promise of Christ's presence in the here and the now. And this means that we can trust that even though we are not perfect and may stumble along the way, with God by our side, we are stumbling towards grace. Amen.
ask you to join me now in professing our faith, the words that we find in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our musical offering today is presented by Jim and Susie Wilbur, America the Beautiful. Let us now come before the triune God in prayer. God of all, through the waters of baptism you claim people of all races, ethnicities, and language as your beloved children. Sustain the baptized and increase their faith that your gospel may be proclaimed throughout the earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of the heavens, your creating spirit animates the universe. We give you thanks for the moon and the stars, for planets and Milky Way galaxy, for all the mysteries of the cosmos that remain unknown to us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of freedom, you have liberated us from sin and death and rescue us from all forms of spiritual, social, and political oppression. Defend us from tyrants in our midst and deliver us from all forms of slavery or corruption. Direct our freedom for works of liberation and wholeness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of compassion, you became vulnerable in the person of Jesus Christ in solidarity with the disempowered. Strengthen those who feel faint, give courage to those who fear, and bring wholeness to those in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of holiness, you send us out into the world to proclaim your love. We pray for our outreach ministries. Equip us as we leave this place to witness and serve our neighbors. And we especially pray for those newly added to our prayers this week. For Dennis Hardy, for Adam, continued prayer for healing. For Joanne, 
and her upcoming surgery for Ralph for healing, healing of right wrist and ribs for Jonathan neighbor of Dennis Hardy for healing after foot surgery and for all was affected by the collapse of the condo in Miami in the Florida area Lord, we now offer our personal prayers to you, either spoken out loud or silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks that in every time and place you call forth prophets who move us towards freedom. Thank you for those who work for human rights community organizers, and all who strive for liberty for all, especially as we remember them on this 4th of July. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. Please join me now in saying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive a blessing. The blessing of God who provides for us, who feeds us and journeys with us, be upon you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.